This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning. Welcome to the 2012 EPIC Conference. First and foremost, a special thank you to our wonderful conference chairs, Anam and Steve, and their entire team for making today possible. I'm Lauren Simons, and this year I have the honor of serving as president of EPIC, or the Emory Public Interest Committee. The event that we're attending today started as just a three and a half page conference proposal, which was reviewed and ultimately selected by the 2011 to 2012 EPIC Student Board. From there, Anam and Steve hit the ground running. They, along with their fundraising, logistics, and marketing chairs, worked throughout the past several months to create a truly meaningful experience for all attendees, no matter one's level of experience, education, or opinions concerning criminal justice here in the South. The idea of a conference focusing on justice rather than simply an evaluation of either criminal prosecution or criminal defense in this region is a deceivingly obvious idea. It's the kind of idea that is so simple that when you hear it, you wonder how you hadn't thought of it first. Despite receiving a number of conference-worthy proposals, Anam and Steve's vision of exposing the disparity that plagues the Southern justice system and suggesting remedies and alternatives to ensure justice for all truly struck a chord with the entire EPIC board. Justice is a concept that is introduced to us, at least in its most basic form, as children. The basic concept of justice seems so simple. When a person does something bad, they should be punished. When a person is wronged or injured, the person who is responsible needs to make it right. Putting bad guys in jail is good. Keeping bad guy, good guys out of jail is good too. We're here today, however, because the criminal justice system isn't this simple in the real world for a number of reasons. First, our quest for justice must extend to all parties involved in a particular case, including the accused. In the real world, two people can be accused of identical crimes, but receive drastically different treatment. The defendant, with enough money to hire an excellent attorney, is more likely to get out of jail on bond, and if convicted, receive a lighter sentence, perhaps a few months of probation at most. The defendant, who can't afford an attorney, won't get out of jail on bond, and probably will receive a much heavier sentence. The defendant who doesn't have enough money to hire an attorney is more likely to end up serving jail time pursuant to a plea deal with the district attorney because the defendant probably won't trust their public defender, no matter how brilliant, albeit overworked and underpaid, he or she may be. Second, it is impossible and in some instances just wrong for judges and juries to not be cognizant of the same factors that may ultimately cause them to make biased decisions. These factors may include race, gender, education, socioeconomic status, history of drug abuse, history of mental health issues, and disability. The challenge is to recognize the possible effect of these factors on the defendant's alleged behavior while maintaining a balanced and unbiased view of how to administer our criminal laws and how to find a truly just result for the victim, the public, and the accused alike. There are few places where judges and juries are tasked with this challenge more often than here in the South. Though we'd like to think that the modern South is a far cry from the South of even 60 years ago, we cannot ignore the lasting effects of a long history of discrimination. The execution of Troy Davis, which occurred just over a year ago, forced us not only to remember that dark history, but also to wonder if, and to what extent, such discrimination still exists. Today, I hope that we all take the time to truly listen to the words of our esteemed keynote speaker, panelists, and fellow conference attendees. I hope that we try to understand various points of view with open ears and open hearts. Further, I hope that by the time we go home tonight, that the concept of criminal justice will seem even more complicated and even simpler than we'd originally thought. It will seem so much more complicated because we will learn that any evaluation of the criminal justice system must be informed by both our geographic and historical context. But it will seem so much simpler because irrespective of that context, the true administration of justice itself is the ultimate goal towards which everyone in the criminal justice system is working. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'd like to introduce Vice Dean Adier for a few words. Let me, uh, let me
Let me join Lauren in uh, first thanking our conference uh, organizers, Anam and Steve, for uh, for doing a great job in uh, in putting this together and uh, and really um, setting a high bar for for the way in which we can develop programs here at the law school and at every law school that invite the the various communities of interest to come together and engage these complicated complex issues of justice in a systematic uh, way. I want to welcome you on my own behalf as well as on behalf of uh, Dean Robert Shapiro and the entire faculty. Dean Shapiro in particular sends his regrets to all of you. He is out of town or otherwise would be here um, for all of us, uh, but perhaps especially for Dean Shapiro. The EPIC conference is a highlight of the academic year, and so he wish, wished that he could have been here. Um, uh, what, what I think makes the EPIC conference, as I suggested, so special is that it's engaging issues that really are of importance to all of us, whether we have a particular interest in the subject matter of the conference or we are engaged, we come to it given an a broader interest in public interest, the themes, the topics, the focus of the EPIC conference each year really highlight subjects that all of us should be engaged with. That's true at Emory, I think, especially, but it's really true of any great law school. Though at Emory, you know, obviously the work of the Public Interest Committee is a, is a source of great pride. Our clinics and field placements are important contributions to the public interest pursuits of the profession and the discourse. Public interest internships, both while in school and after graduation, the pro bono program, the loan repayment assistance program, and in many other ways we see this manifestation, this sort of physical manifestation of the ways in which public interest is hugely important to this law school and the work that it strives to do. More fundamentally though, I want to suggest that public interest is at the core of what it means to be a legal profession and in turn what it means to be a lawyer. That's always been true, I think, if we think about what the nature of the legal profession is. But I want to suggest to you that it's especially important today for two reasons. First, the needs. Um, if we look at the world around us today, whether you see twinklings of improvement in the economy and what's going on in the world, or you think we're sort of uh, we're going the wrong direction, uh, the, the needs of our society today, the needs of American society today, and really global society today, in terms of public interest service, in terms of the work that all of you will do as public interest lawyers, and I mean public interest lawyers, whether or not you're working for a big law firm or for a public defender's office, the work that you'll do, there is a desperate need for. If we look at the spread of poverty, if we look about ch at challenges of education in the United States and again around the world, if we look at access to food, if hung issues of hunger, when we look at these issues and how pervasive the problems of public interest are today, there is a desperate need for all of us and for our profession to be engaged carefully, thoughtfully, systematically with the place of public interest. But more fundamentally, as to a profession, I want to suggest that we're at a critical juncture at this, at this moment. The profession of law is at, a, is at a critical juncture. There are key questions that are being asked about the future of the profession and where the profession is going and key questions being asked about where the profession has gone. I mean, so lest we think it's only forward looking, <clears throat> it is clearly the case that over the last 20 and 30 and 40 years, the profession of law has become more and more of a business. And there may be many ways in which that's been a beneficial pattern and trend, but there are surely many losses that we've suffered by virtue of that as well. And those questions, I think, are being asked at this moment in an important way. Thus, this juncture presents an opportunity for us to assess and more fundamentally, I think, to reassert the core identity of law, the core ident our, our core identity as lawyers as being part of a profession, and that profession being one of service. So the work then that we're doing, the Public Interest uh, Committee is doing, the work that this conference is engaged with, really, I think, goes to the heart of where we are as a society and a political and social and economic order, and clearly goes to the heart of what we are as a profession. The topic today um, obviously captures that in very stark relief and highlights the extent to which that is, that is, that is true. Um, criminal justice is rarely a popular cause. Uh, it's not, it, do, it, doesn't make for, it doesn't make for popular crusades the way perhaps other initiatives in the realm of public interest might do. It's also, as often as not, invisible. So while some cases make the headlines, most do not. Most criminal justice is done, shadows is too strong a word, but is done out of the public light. Um, the task of lawyers then, 
whichever side of the aisle they sit on, the task of lawyers in some sense is to ensure that justice is done notwithstanding that lack of public light, notwithstanding that lack of public attention. There's no better place to think about that aspiration. There's no better place to think about that need, I think, than in the context of the South. Obviously, capital punishment has been a central part of the, the history of the South, I want to say, but of criminal justice in the South and justice in the South over the last 100, 200 years. And so that is one way in which thinking about criminal justice in the South is particularly important. I would say that more recently, the scourge of drugs, even in our smallest communities, rural communities, makes attention to criminal justice in the South a worthy, a worthy subject for the conference this year. And obviously, maybe most of all, but surely in the background of all of this analysis, the issue of race and criminal justice is one that it's not only that it can't be avoided, it's not meaningful to engage the question of criminal justice in the South without acknowledging, uh, acknowledging issues of race. So this is a great topic, um, one that I think, uh, I think Emory is well suited to, to host, to present. We have a great faculty engaged in this area, Kay Levine, Martha Grace Duncan, um, Morgan Cloud. We have a great set of clinics and field placements that engage this area. We have a number of student groups, the Public Interest Committee, the Criminal Justice Society, that are actively engaged with a great set of adjuncts that work in this area. And so I am confident that today we will have a rich discussion. Let me conclude then uh, just with a brief mention of, of the honor that the law school feels in having uh, Steve Bright as our keynote speaker here. Steve has been a member of our community for many years. For years he taught um, as an adjunct member of the faculty. Um, he received an honorary Doctor of Laws degree in 2006 from the university, a well-deserved recognition. I count myself lucky thus to, to call him a colleague. Um, as I was mentioning at breakfast a few minutes ago, I also count myself lucky to call him my teacher. Um, he was actually my very first law school professor as a visiting student to law school, trying to figure out where to go to law school. The class that I sat in on uh, was Professor Bright's, Mr. Bright's class, and as I think you will all see by the end of his remarks, it's no surprise that I took his instruction and went to the school where he was teaching. So thank you so much. Welcome to all of you, and I think let me turn it over to our hosts to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Adier. Welcome to the 2012 EPIC Conference. My name is Anam Ismail. My name is Steve Justice. Thank you all for being here and sh sharing your Saturday with us, embracing the traffic outside. We recognize that this is a topic that can bring many intense feelings to surface, including sadness, anger, and vengeance. We thank you for participating in what will surely be emotional conversations, but undeniably necessary ones. Before we begin, we must take a moment to express the most sincere thank yous for several individuals and groups without whom this conference would not have been possible. Our generous sponsoring organizations, the Student Bar Association, the Office of the Provost, the Center for Career Development, and the Legal Association for Women's Students. Ms. Sue McAvoy, EPIC's faculty advisor, for helping us promote the conference, our wonderful executive board for their constant support, and our amazing committee chairs, Carolina Grigorowska, Ernesto Escobar, Megan Ballard, and Adam Rose. This truly was a team effort. Thank you. Criminal justice is arguably one of the most polarizing and controversial aspects of the legal field. This is alarming for many reasons, but perhaps most so because there is no area of law that affects each of us more on a daily basis. It is also ironically, all too often, a very easy problem to ignore. Not in my city, not my fault, not in my budget. This conference aims to bring together individuals who have devoted their careers and lives to, in recognition of the fact that providing a fair and honorable justice system is a responsibility that we all share, and when, we do, when it fails, a cost we all pay. The conference is structured in such a way that will allow members of the audience to experience and track the process a criminal defendant goes through. In doing so, we hope to expose the challenges facing not only criminal defense attorneys, but law enforcement officers, prosecutors, and judges. Each of these individuals plays a critical role in protecting civil liberties and also our communities. We view these actors as a chain, each one as important as the next, all equally necessary to ensure a just outcome. The pretrial phase raises important issues regarding the Fourth Amendment and fundamental issues of criminal procedure. This is the defendant's first contact with the state, almost inevitably in a tense and confrontational setting for all parties. 
Issues of search and seizure and arrest will trigger core discussions of where we choose to place our values and whether security must truly come at the cost of liberty. As the defendant proceeds through trial, his or her future is intertwined with the decisions of all parties concerning sentencing and punishment, including the use of capital punishment. Beyond the traditional means, there now exists alternative routes for trying a case, including drug courts, juvenile courts, and courts for the disabled. Finally, if he or she is convicted, they face the looming reality of a dangerous prison system, and if released, the, incredibly difficult, the incredible difficulties of reentering society, but as a convicted felon. The onslaught of DNA testing has also raised issues concerning wrongful convictions and exonerations. Mr. Clarence Harrison is joining us today and will share his experience in serving over 17 years in prison for a crime that he did not commit. We are honored to have you here, Mr. Harrison. The issues through present throughout the nation are particularly prevalent in the South. Our, our experiences within the criminal justice system, one doing criminal defense work and the other criminal prosecution, have either implicitly or explicitly pressed upon us the idea that there are two sides of the system. And much like a political party, you are either one or the other, but not both. There is all too often a dividing wall in the criminal justice system. While we recognize this wall, we hope that this conference shows that this wall is not insurmountable. It requires overcoming a dark history of discrimination, distrust, and neglect. Today's speakers and panelists approach these issues from different points of view, yet are committed to correcting the system by addressing the problems and proposing solutions. Also sitting amongst us are a group of upcoming lawyers who will face many of the same, but many new challenges. Leaving this conference, we hope that you will resist the temptation to choose a side. There is one side and one promise, justice for all. I would now like to introduce a man who exemplifies the mission of our conference and has dedicated his life to the pursuit of justice. Stephen B. Bright is president and senior counsel of the Southern Center for Human Rights and teaches at Yale Law School. Subjects of his litigation, teaching and writing include capital punishment, legal representation for poor people accused of crimes, conditions and practices in prisons and jails, racial discrimination in the criminal justice system, he has twice argued in one cases before the United States Supreme Court. Both cases involved racial discrimination in the composition of juries. He has testified on many occasions before committees of both the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. He has also taught at law schools including Harvard, Georgetown, Northeastern, and our very own Emory Law. He received the American Bar Association's Thurgood Marshall Award in 1998, the American Civil Liberty Union's Roger Baldwin Medal of Liberty in 1991, the National Legal Aid and Defender Association's Kutag Dodds Prize in 1992, and the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008. Please join us in welcoming Mr. Stephen Bright. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a, a remarkably uh, well done joint introduction and uh, speech there. and I. Uh, appreciate it very much, uh, Anand and Steve. Thank you, and thank you for all that we've talked about getting ready for this. I want to commend the board uh, of uh, EPIC for having this topic, the criminal justice system, as some have alluded to already, for most people in our society is out of sight and out of mind. It's a system that deals almost entirely with poor people, uh, not the uh, upper class people and, and not even most middle class people until that one day when a son is or daughter is busted for drugs or something like that. And there's been tremendous neglect uh, of this system. Uh, it is one that uh, is perhaps the most spectacular failure in our government. Uh, it's one that lawyers have a particular responsibility for uh, because after all we are the trustees, lawyers are the trustees of the system of justice. And I appreciate very much the opportunity to just reflect for a little bit about the history and the presence of where we are. Because history is so critically important, as Leon Higginbotham said, if we don't face the impact of the past, of the, our, our history of racial oppression, uh, and realize its impact on the present, we will never escape uh, its, uh, its, its uh, influence on us. But before I do that, I just want to give everyone here, and some of you already know this, but some of you may not, in my work and in the office I'm in every day, we receive letters from people uh, who are writing us about their criminal case, writing us about their conditions in prison, writing whatever it may be. 
I got this letter in May, and I think it speaks fairly eloquently for the problems of many poor people accused of crimes uh, in our society. Um, dear Mr. Bright, I currently have a first degree arson case in Carroll County Superior Court. I was indicted in March 2010 after my home burned down in 2009. I was homeless for quite a while after the fire and I was forced, forced to rely upon friends uh, to find a place to sleep. I worked really hard. I had two jobs uh, that I worked at. Uh, I continued to go to school at community college. Uh, when I was indicted, I applied for a public defender. And the lawyer I got was completely incompetent uh, and would not work on my case, would not discuss the case with me, and I did most of the investigation myself. I complained, uh, and three months later, another lawyer was added to my case. She constantly encouraged me, a person who has never been charged with any crime, all capital, of any sort, to take 15 years in prison offered by the prosecution. I declined. A friend provided some money so I could hire my own lawyer, but this lawyer turned out to be even worse. He missed court dates for weeks at a time. The court even fined him for not showing up. Um, and they would just tell her to come back. She'd come, her lawyer wouldn't be there, come back the next day. Finally, she loses both her jobs uh, as a result uh, of, of the time that it's taking her to go down. Uh, I've asked over and over, she said, to proceed with trial, but when a trial date comes, he doesn't show up. I have no way to hire a new lawyer. I have no place to go. I'm a certified nurse's aide, but I can't be employed because I have an arson charge hanging over me. I don't know how to fix this, and I've asked to be placed in jail until this is over. I ask this not to sound ungrateful for being out on bond, but because I fear I may take my own life or I may die from the conditions of being homeless. The last offer, that request was denied as well. She could not even get in jail uh, pending trial. Uh, the last offer was 10 years on probation and restitution of half a million dollars. And I told my attorney, absolutely not. I told him, I don't care if I go to prison for the next 20 years, I am never going to accept blame for something I did not do. A guilty plea, even with no jail time, would ruin my life. It would uh, make my license uh, invaluable, and I would never be taken seriously again. I've had over 20 continuances. I've lost jobs. I've lost my home. I've lost my dogs. I sleep in my car. I'm going to lose my car because I can't replay the loans I took out to pay my lawyer's expenses. I'm tired and beaten, and I don't know how to fight this. My only question is, what do I do when I have no way to care for myself, no place to go, no attorney who's interested in my case? It's been days now since I've eaten, and I feel myself getting sick. I just don't want to die without someone knowing what is happening to me and how I have cried and plead and begged for help over the last three years. I'm only 23, Mr. Bright, and I have fought to stay afloat for the last three years and I just want to know what there's left for me to do while I'm here. That's the plight of so many people all over this state and every state. Desperately, you talk about desperate needs uh, that people have for a lawyer, for a caring lawyer, for a lawyer who will talk to them and talk to them about their case. Uh, Shauna Shackelford, who wrote that letter, summarizes it uh, as well. Uh, as I know. Uh, and we took that case when, uh, normally we can't take all the cases we hear about, but when somebody tells me they're suicidal and they think they're going to die from the conditions of being homeless, it sort of pulls it at the heartstrings in a, in a dramatic way. Uh, and I realized the likelihood that the line public defender assigned to her, dealing with an arson case, when we took this case on and we suddenly realized what we had, we had to hire three experts. We had to get all into the forensic science, the fire science, and, and all of that. Uh, we uh, finally did what was the most important thing we did. We got a lawyer, uh, uh, Michael McKenzie from Cozen O'Connor, 
who had handled arson cases the last 35 years, and suddenly we had somebody who knew everything there was to know about arson cases. The long and short of it was we were able to show that it was not arson. We were able to go to the district attorney and present our witnesses and our evidence and everything we had, and the case was dismissed in August. Uh, but that would not have happened. When people hear that, they say, boy, that client was really lucky. Uh, but that shows how serendipitous it may be for someone to receive uh, adequate legal representation. It just simply, she was caught in a system where the only way of dealing with the cases was through pleas. And when this case involves somebody who said, I'm not guilty, I'm not pleading, I don't care if I have to spend the next 20 years in prison, it was ill-equipped uh, to deal with her. Well, Laura Simmons has already said many of the things that, uh, that I want to say about the system. One of the things I want to agree with at the outset and then talk about the problems. Uh, is, of course, we have to have laws, we have to enforce the laws, we have to protect the community. There's no issue about that. But the question is the integrity of our system and the legitimacy uh, of our system. Uh, and as I said, it's important, particularly here in the South, to look at the system and look at our history and look at what we've done over the years and how big an impact it has on us. The South is different, and it's different for one reason, slavery. It's different because of slavery. The impact that race has had in the criminal justice system of the Confederacy is quite pronounced. Before the Civil War, when the northern states were abolishing the death penalty, uh, some like Michigan, Rhode Island, some other states, Maine, abolished it altogether. Almost all the other states were at least limiting the death penalty to murder cases. But in the South, the death penalty still applied to petty crimes. It still applied in handing out leaflets was a death penalty offense in Louisiana. Uh, and the reason, of course, was that the South had to maintain a captive population, a population of people who didn't come here looking for opportunities, but people who were hunted down, hunted down in their homes in Africa, captured like animals, chained, and taken in slave ships and brought here, sold and treated like animals for this part of our history. And the criminal justice system in the South was critical, critical to maintaining slavery. In three of the southern states, the number of Africans outnumbered the number of white people. So it's a very tenuous thing whether you can keep all these people in slavery and you can maintain this captive population uh, without the harshest kind of penalties. And that's why today when we look at the death penalty and we see that the death penalty is a southern phenomenon. Texas executes by far more than any other state, Virginia, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, Florida. It's the states of the old Confederacy. That's where the executions are taking place. Increasingly, the other states are, are abandoning the death penalty. Five have recently. So that, that affects us. That's one critical part. Uh, of it. The second was the end of the Civil War and emancipation. And at that point, the free slaves were kept down by two things. One, terrorism, lynching, and secondly, convict leasing and the death penalty. And once again, the criminal justice system played the major role in keeping down the freed slaves, and in fact, keeping and perpetuating slavery all the way up until World War II. Richard Russell, who celebrated so much here in Georgia with a federal building named after him, a statue on the lawn of the Capitol. Read sometime about how Richard Russell was so successful in fighting anti-lynching legislation. When black people were being lynched for, a lot of people think black people were lynched because they were at least suspected of a crime, maybe even guilty of a crime, but many people were lynched just because they were black. When President McKinley was president, he appointed a black postmaster in eastern Georgia. The white people didn't like a black postmaster, so they lynched him. Uh, in Richard Russell's hometown of Winder, Georgia, two couples, uh, man, woman, two, two couples, uh, African Americans, pulled over, taken to the river, hung in the trees, lynched, hadn't committed any crime uh, whatsoever. One woman who protested the fact that her husband had been lynched was lynched. Uh, for going to law enforcement. And of course, convict leasing, which many, I, I, I teach this in my classes and, and I always ask my students, how many people knew about convict leasing? 
How many people knew that after the Civil War, people were arrested on any kind of petty charge you can imagine, loitering, not having papers? That was, if you were a black person and you were in, in the society, you had to be able to show your papers to, why, why are you here? Uh, and you could be arrested for that, and then you could be leased. You could be leased out to the turpentine camps and to the railroads and the coal mines around Birmingham and to all of these places. And David Oshinsky, the, the great Pulitzer Prize winning historian, talked about how this was worse than slavery. Because with slavery, you at least owned the people. You had some interest in protecting your property. But when you had convict leasing, you could literally work people to death, and then you could just get some more conflict, uh, some more convicts. Uh, around Birmingham, there's a, there's a book that is absolutely indispensable. Uh, Oshinsky's book is called Worse Than Slavery. Uh, the other is Douglas Blackman's book, as a Wall Street reporter here in Atlanta wrote a book called Slavery by Another Name, which is about slavery, uh, uh, convict leasing in Alabama. Alabama managed to maintain slavery all the way until World War II, that long after the Civil War, and it did it through its criminal courts. And the mining that was going on around Birmingham was being done by uh, convicts who were being leased, and they'd send these people into these primitive mines that they had then, the mine collapsed. No big deal, just get some more convicts. Uh, and if there weren't enough convicts uh, for whatever the job was, just go round up a bunch of black people uh, and, and, and send them. Oshinsky says in his book on this, convict leasing was designed for blacks, not whites. It was possible to send a black person to prison for almost any pretext, but difficult to get a white person there unless he committed a very serious crime. The South's economic development can be traced to the blood of its prisoners. Southern courts allowed whites to exploit blacks without legal limit, to withhold the most basic rights and safeguards while claiming to be indulgent, paternalistic, and fair. Turn the criminal justice system into a corrupt and capricious entity, completely undeserving of respect. And we've never had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the United States like we had in uh, South Africa. And we've never looked back at this, uh, you know, this question, who built it? I'll tell you who built it here in the South. The slaves built it, and the convicts built it, and the people who got rich on it were white people who got absolutely free labor. And so, well, they, they, I guess they paid a, a token amount uh, for leasing these convicts. When lynching became such an embarrassment that so many people were being lynched and the New York Times and uh, Ida B. Wells and other people were bringing it, NAACP, were bringing it to people's attention. Uh, and even Richard Russell now was having trouble preventing Congress from passing an anti-lynching law, although Congress never passed one, thanks to Senator Russell and, and, and others. Uh, the, the, the perfunctory death penalty trial in which the mob was told to just wait, just wait and let the law take its course. And everybody knew what that meant. That meant that the defendants would be brought in, they would be given some token lawyer, get some token representation, uh, they'd be tried by an all-male, all-white jury, they'd be sentenced to death, and sometimes, in some cases, as short as an hour after the verdict came back, they'd be executed. When the Scottsboro case was the, the famous case of the Scottsboro boys, who these nine African-American youths accused of raping two white women on a train going through Scottsboro. And they give them these trials that all take place in a week, one right after the other, and uh, there's a mob outside cheering when the verdicts come back and the death sentences come back and, and, and all of that. Uh, and there's sort of this national outrage about this and how unfair it was and how they didn't get lawyers until the morning of trial. And as uh, Dan Carter, Another great Southern historian reports the people of Scottsboro are like, what is the complaint? I mean, normally we would lynch these people. We gave them a trial. What much of a trial? But it was a trial is what passes for a trial. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so the prominence of the death penalty, as I said, was partly uh, for slavery but it was also after emancipation, the death penalty replaced lynching as a way of enforcing this terrorism. Uh, you know, it's interesting uh, about the anti-lynching law. Now we pass a terrorism bill without they even having time to read it. Uh, but let me tell you what was carried on in this country 
by the Ku Klux Klan and by others, and by the most prominent people in the society who were often pictured in the newspapers and so forth, uh, the lynching of people. Uh, uh, that's who was carrying this on uh, during the time. And the courts were doing two things. One, they weren't protecting people. They were not providing the protection of the law. There was no prosecution of people. There would always be, uh, in Idowell's uh, documents, as case after case, a coroner's report that would say uh, this uh, happened uh, at the hands of parties unknown, even though the newspaper would have the names of all the people involved in the lynching and often have pictures of people uh, in it. Uh, but uh, the death penalty trials, uh, unfortunately, have not improved a huge amount uh, since the time of the Scottsboro case. Uh, and the whole era of Jim Crow justice, which again, we don't study enough in law schools and we don't remember, but the whole idea was to oppress the freed slaves and keep them down as laborers for the plantations and other people. Uh, of course, that wasn't the only thing that was done. There was also denying people the vote, denying people education uh, based upon their race. But then we get to the final chapter, what the current chapter is in this, which is after the civil rights movement of the 1960s, mass incarceration. Uh, today, we, in the 1970s, we had about 200,000 people in prisons and jails in this country. Today, 2.3 million people. We're way ahead of the country. The United States has the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world, and we're way ahead of Russia, which is second, and Rwanda, which is third. Um, the war on drugs, as Michelle Alexander has documented, and others have documented, but I commend to you her book, uh, The New Jim Crow, uh, talks about how this has been uh, the return to Jim Crow in terms of the impact that our criminal laws have had on communities of color how it's destroying people, it's destroying families, it's destroying communities. And so much of that is the so-called war on drugs. Today, black men make up just about 6% of the population of the United States of America, but they're 35%, they're the highest percent of the prison population. Um, today, at every stage, from arrest to sentencing, if you're a person of color, you're more likely to be stopped. You're more likely to be abused during that stop you're more likely to be arrested at the end of that stop as opposed to released on citation and allowed to go back. You're more likely, if you're black, to be denied bail when you come to court, whenever it is you finally come to court. Uh, you're more likely to be held in jail, uh, more likely to be charged with more serious charges where there's a range of charges which could be charged. And it goes all the way through to sentencing where you're more likely to be put on probation if you're white than if you're African American. And race, as we all know, influences tremendously who's sentenced to death or life imprisonment without parole. Um, you know, there's been this talk this week about exclusion of race solution of using race as a factor in admissions to universities, University of Texas in particular. But I haven't seen any white people filing lawsuits to end the racial preferences in stops and frisks by police officers. Last year, 600,000 people, 600,000 people were stopped and frisked by the New York Police Department. 84% were blacks and Latinos. White people aren't getting stopped and frisked nearly as much. I mean, really, we should have a lawsuit there. Uh, police are 14 more, uh, a large study that Chef Fagan did at Columbia, uh, police are 14% more likely to use force. That, that's what I was talking about a moment ago. More likely to throw a person on the ground, uh, draw a weapon, uh, point a weapon at the person, hit them with a baton, use pepper spray, put them in handcuffs. Much more likely to happen if the person's black than if they're white. That's today. This is how this history, this is today what's going on. In Atlanta, 93% of all marijuana prosecutions are against African Americans. Do you really think that in Atlanta, 93% of the people that smoke marijuana are African Americans? I mean, do you really think that for one minute? Um, and we continue to exclude people of color. I say that as I travel around the South and I see a lot of things have changed, I see African Americans in the legislature. One's going to be here today, Stacey Abrams, the minority leader. I see city councils, mayor of Atlanta, man who almost was beaten to death in the Freedom Rides, and, and then when he tried to cross the John Pettus Bridge. 
John Lewis is my congressman. But I go to the courts, I travel all over the South and I go to the courts and when you sit in the courts waiting for your case to be called or when you're there, you see that nothing has changed. You look up in the front and the judge is white, the prosecutors are white, the court appointed lawyers are usually white. Uh, the only people of color will be this group of black men brought in in orange jumpsuits, handcuffed together and put in the jury box or on the first couple of rows. Uh, and when lawyer will come along, and in, at least in some places, uh, Cordell being a good example, Ben Hill County being another, there are examples all over the state. Uh, the lawyers will meet with each person for all of uh, maybe five, ten minutes. Uh, this is the first time they've seen the lawyer. And then just a short time later, they'll come up to the court and they'll plead guilty and they'll be sentenced. And that's the totality of their exposure to the, quote, criminal, I call it the criminal court system. Uh, because there's no justice being done in these courts. There's no pretense of justice. We're just processing people through. The efforts to exclude black people from participating in the system uh, are historic too. When in North Carolina, I was just reading a history uh, of, of race and the justice system in North Carolina. Uh, and when black people finally got the vote, which was not until the 1960s, 100 years after the Civil War, finally managed to get on the voter rolls, finally managed to get in the jury pools. And what North Carolina did, give more peremptory strikes to the prosecution. So yes, now we have blacks in the jury pools, but we've got more strikes to get rid of them. Of course, what we did in Georgia was we didn't put any blacks in the jury pools until federal courts in case after case after case after case. That's why a lot of death sentences were never carried out in Georgia, was because you had counties that were 35% African-American that didn't have, and Washington and Jefferson counties that are over 50% African-American, and yet you had virtually no African-American representation in the jury pools because they were chosen uh, by jury commissioners who chose uh, on, on the basis of, of race. Uh, it, it, it is um, no surprise or accident uh, that Alabama and Mississippi are the states that give the most peremptory strikes, that is the discretionary strikes that lawyers can use to strike someone. And even with more black representation, the way in which prosecutors will manipulate the courts. If you're charged with a capital crime or charged with any kind of crime, but the ones I've looked at at Capitol, in Orleans Parish, that's New Orleans, Louisiana, you're in a parish that's about 70% African American. You probably won't be prosecuted in the state courts. You'll probably be prosecuted by the United States Attorney's Office in the federal court because in the Eastern District of Louisiana, the federal district, only 20% of the people are African American because you have all the white flight counties around New Orleans that are included. On the other hand, if you have a case in Jefferson Parish or if you have a case in one of the other parishes that is 90% or 95%, 100% white, that case is gonna be prosecuted in state court. So even now, even today, even in the Obama administration, even in the Holder administration, we're manipulating, and this is not just happening in New Orleans, it's happening in St. Louis, it's happening in Maryland, Prince George's County, Maryland, it's happening in other parts of the country as well, uh, in terms of using uh, the, 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 the venue to minimize the number of black people. Uh, the Supreme Court decided a case which you may study here, and I hope you do, but I hope you realize the reality of it, which I want to talk about for a minute. Uh, Batson versus Kentucky. Uh, in 1986, the Supreme Court finally, after a long history of people using their peremptory strikes in Swain versus Alabama, the court noted that there had never been an African American on a jury in Talladega County, Alabama, even though the population was 35% African American. And the same thing is true in Columbus, Georgia, and a lot of other places. And finally, after the scathing criticism of the Swain allowing this, Swain saying you can strike on the basis of religion or race or whatever, you have complete liberty to exercise these peremptory strikes every month. The court decides in Batson and it says, this is part of our unceasing effort to end racial discrimination in the court system. Always watch the Supreme Court when it says that. One of the things you got to learn is that just because you put it, my mother told, uh, grandmother taught me this, that a piece of paper will lie down and let you write anything on it. That includes things the Supreme Court justices write. In the quarter of a century, of course, that's what they said in McCluskey versus Kemp, the case that allowed the death penalty to continue in 
uh, five to four decision, even despite the racial disparities uh, in the use of the death penalty in Georgia. Uh, the court said, well, this is inevitable. It's just going to be inevitable. And also, if we looked at the racial disparities with regard to the death penalty, then we'd have to look at the racial disparities with regard to all other sentencing in the criminal justice system, what, what Justice Brennan called the fear of too much justice, which is what we suffer from. If there's race discrimination going on, as we know there is in drug sentencing and in all other kinds of sentencing that's going on, in the way in which police deal with people and all that, we ought to be putting our efforts at rooting it out and stopping it, not whistling past the graveyard and pretending that it doesn't exist. But in a quarter of a century since Batson was decided, it has come to stand for exactly the opposite of what it was supposed to be. It now stands for the unceasing efforts of courts to avoid granting relief based upon race discrimination. The Supreme Court is uh, one, one of the uh, courts that uh, looked at this was the Illinois uh, Appellate Court. It said, now we come to the charade called Batson. Surely every prosecutor has a list of handy dandy race neutral reasons and the way this works is if the prosecution strikes a disproportionate number of African Americans, the defense can object, and then the judge, and, and the court asks in this case, he says, can they really keep a straight face while they're doing this? The judge said, what are your reasons for striking? Oh, I struck that person for this reason. Oh, I struck that person for that reason. These are all race-neutral reasons. The Supreme Court held in one case that having a beard is a race-neutral reason. Hot dog. Every prosecutor now knows when you strike that black person, say, it's because he had a beard. Also, you can strike because the person wears an earring, that's a race neutral reason. And there's a whole, uh, there's a whole uh, of course, long list of court approved race neutral reasons. But the, the, the real reason that Batson doesn't work is that you're asking the defense lawyer to make a challenge that says the prosecutor intentionally struck on the basis of race and lied about it by giving a pretextual reason. A lot of prosecutors don't like to be called racist bigots. Um, I don't blame them. Uh, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, it's true. Or at least it's part of the calculus that having people of color on the jury are going to make it less likely for the prosecution to prevail. And a lot of judges are hostile. North Carolina just recently had a case decided under its Racial Justice Act, and I just, in my discussion of Batson with this, they aggregated all these jury strikes. You know, it's one thing in one case. In Georgia, we have 10 strikes on each side. So you have maybe five, uh, the Snyder case that I heard in the Supreme Court, they had 15, uh, 12 strikes, but uh, five black people only struck five for five. Uh, but, in, and, and, and so you say, well, that could have been coincidence. It may have been that he used 12 strikes and just five of them happened to be people of color. But when they did an ask in North Carolina, uh, they looked at uh, 7,500 veneermen, uh, 6,000 white, 1,200 black, and the rest unknown. If you're black, you're 52% more likely to be struck in North Carolina. If you're white, you've got about 25% chance of being struck. Uh, the criminal justice system is the part of American society that's been least affected by the civil rights movement. And that's just a polite way of saying the criminal courts are the most racist institutions in our society today. And we gotta face that fundamental truth. And the, and the thing that's particularly bad about that is that the courts are supposed to be enforcing the law. The judges and the courts are supposed to be enforcing the law. The prosecutors are supposed to be seeking justice. And yet, that's not the case. And, and the same thing is true in the other area I want to talk about, which is how poverty affects people in the system. And the fundamental consequence of poverty is having a court-appointed lawyer, like Ms. Shackelford had, the woman whose letter I read at the start, whose lawyers wanted her to plead guilty to 15 years, or wanted her to plead guilty to probation, wanted anything except to go to trial. March 18th of this coming year, and March 18th of 2013, will be the 50th anniversary of the Supreme Court's decision in Gideon versus Wainwright, when the court held that any person facing a loss of liberty in a felony case was entitled to a lawyer. Uh, and then later in August Singer versus Hamlin, the court said in any kind of loss of liberty, you're entitled to a lawyer. And in juvenile cases, you're entitled to a lawyer. 
And yet today, every day in thousands of courtrooms around this country, including courtrooms in Georgia, the right to counsel is being violated routinely. People are going into courts, and I'm not talking about what you're talking about, the top tier felony trial court, superior court here in Georgia, whatever they call it in other states, or whether you're talking about the municipal courts that serve as the cash cow for their community, where they don't even try to get justice, it's just a matter of getting money. These are courts of profit, not courts of justice. But all those courts, the right to counsel is being violated. People are not being told about their right to a lawyer. People are pleading guilty without lawyers. People here in Georgia are sometimes told there's a $50 application fee to have a lawyer. They're not told that it can be waived. They're not told that you have a right to counsel. So that constitutional right to counsel, absolutely meaningless for those people. Hills McGee, this veteran, is living on disability uh, payments in Augusta. They tell him it's going to cost you $50 for a lawyer. Hills McGee doesn't have $50. He ends up pleading guilty just on his own. He's given a fairly small fine, uh, about, a th I'm trying to remember what it was, $1,000 or so. Of course, he can't pay it. Here again, you see the great difference in, in the rich and poor in the court system. A person who could afford it would, of course, write out a check that day and be out of court, and that would be the end of it. But Hills McGee is told, no, 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 Mr. McGee, you can pay it on, um, no, he's fined $200. I'm sorry, $200. You can pay it in installments. But, Part of that is you pay $39 a month to the private probation company. So by the time they finally arrest Mr. McGee, he's paid in over $700 on a $200 fine. But he still hasn't paid everything, adding in $40 a month for all these months because he missed some months and, and all that. And so he's arrested and thrown in jail. You don't think they're debtors' prisons in this country. They're debtors' prisons, and again, Supreme Court has said, in a case right out of Georgia, Bearden versus Georgia, as well as another case, Tate versus Short, as well as other cases, that you cannot imprison people for their inability to pay a fine. If it's a willful failure to pay, if they have the money and won't pay, you can, but if it's a not, and yet this happens every day. Go to jail clearing day in Augusta, they bring all the people up who are in jail. Pay some money, you can get out. If you can't, you're gonna to go to jail in the hopes that the family is somehow gonna come up uh, with this money. Well, the problem with this is, of course, this is complete lawlessness. And Gideon, the Supreme Court didn't say the right to counsel is a good idea and we recommend it highly. American Bar Association might have done that, but not the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court of the United States said as a matter of constitutional law, as a matter of the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution, if somebody's accused of a crime, you've got to provide them with a lawyer. And yet the courts aren't doing that. The courts have said you can't lock people up because they can't pay, whether it's their child support or whether it's their fine or whatever, and yet it happens every day. And so how can we possibly claim that we operate under the rule of law when the judges, the very people who take an oath to uphold the law, and the other actors in the system, all lawyers, uh, go along with this day in and day out to the point that it's part of the culture. It's not challenged so often because it has become uh, part uh, of the challenge. We go down, we travel around the state, and we look at what's going on in, in different places. The Supreme Court announced uh, in a couple of cases last March, they finally revealed the dirty little secret that, that we all know, uh, as, as Justice Kennedy said, it's not a system of trials, it's a system of pleas. Federal court, 97% of all federal cases are resolved with guilty pleas. State courts, 94% of all cases are resolved with guilty pleas. We go down occasionally, to, as I said, different places. We were down in uh, Cordillo, Crisp County. A little courtroom, if you can call it a courtroom, the room they use as a courtroom in the jail. And 10 people standing there in front of the judge and the prosecutor at one end and the public defender at the other end. And these people are all gonna plead guilty together. And uh, the public defender represents nine of them, but not all. One dealt directly with the district attorney because it's interesting when the judges take the bench there in the public court, in the courthouse, they tell the people in the audience now, if you're accused of a crime, this is a district attorney, you can come up and talk to the district attorney. This is the public defender, you can come up and talk to the public defender. There's no suggestion that one is better than the other or that if you're accused of a crime, you might want to talk to the defense lawyer as opposed to the prosecutor. 
uh, and, and I'll tell you why that it becomes important. So what happens is all these people plead guilty in unison. They you raise your right to counsel. Yes, we all have a right to appeal. Yes, we all raise our right So they all plead guilty in a, in a group. Uh, and then it's time to sentence each one. Now we're going to have a little individual attention. And so with each defendant, uh, the prosecutor asks for prison time or jail time or probation with restitution or fines or whatever, whatever sentence they want. Then the judge turns to the public defender standing at the other end of the line, and he says, Your Honor, please tack on the $50 public defender fee. Now, if you're one of the people standing in that line, you're kind of like, who's on my side? You know, this person down here is asking that I be fined. This guy down here, who I only met a few minutes ago, is asking that I be fined. Uh, who's on my side? And of course, the Supreme Court said in those cases, uh, Fry versus Missouri and uh, uh, the other case that uh, the Sixth Amendment applies. The Sixth Amendment would mean confidential meetings with clients. It would mean looking at some of the government's uh, police reports or whatever information there is about the crime. It would mean knowing something about the client so that the sentencing, the important thing often that the criminal courts do is this great sorting out. Who's going to be on probation? Who's going to spend weekends in jail? Who's going to spend months or years in prison? Who's going to get life imprisonment? Who's going to get life without parole? Who's going to get death penalty? Those decisions can only be made if you have information about the facts of the crime and the role of the offender in the crime, as well as facts about the, per the offender, who this person is, how they got to this pass in life. What contributed to this? Are there any mitigating factors? Not that excuse or justify what happened, but at least ought to be taken into account. So we're not sending people away. That day, one of the people who was pleading guilty had tried to steal some boxer shorts from a Dollar General store. He didn't get away with it, caught him. Five years, 10 years, five to serve. That's your taxpayer dollar at work, spending five years in prison for trying, okay, he had tried before, he was an habitual, Petty thief. Um, that same place, we see a lot of interesting things. That's, I've seen a couple of letters from clients there that I've never seen any other place. One uh, was a client who asked for a bond review hearing, and the public defender wrote back and said, we have a policy of not filing bond review motions for 90 days after bond is set. Thanks a million. You know, one of the most important things a lawyer does is file a bond review motion and get their client back into the community, back home, back at work, so that they can maintain the community ties they have and so they can keep on uh, with their work. I had a fellow, Chris Phillips, here in town that we put on before Judge Shu when we were uh, suing Fulton County about the representation provided. And uh, he gets arrested on an old warrant, he spends two weeks in jail, and he's released. He never sees a judge, never sees a lawyer. But when he goes back to the place where he was clerk, where he was working as a clerk, he's lost his job. When he goes back to the little room he was renting, he's lost his room because he hadn't paid the rent. His stuff's all out on the street. He can't pay the rent now. He doesn't have a job. And so we've taken somebody right on the margins. Chris was schizophrenic. But he was doing as well as he could do, making the best of it. Now he's homeless. And he'll remain homeless uh, after that. Um, that's, I, I say often, you know, the, pro, the, 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 um, the process is often the punishment. Just being arrested. We found a fellow in the Cordillo Jail, this was some time ago before the public defender system was set up. Uh, uh, we found a, a fellow in the jail, uh, uh, Tia Holly, who was an intern with us then, a lawyer now. Uh, 13 months, he'd been in jail 13 months. He'd been represented for the high crime of loitering. That's standing around while black. You heard of driving while black? Well, he didn't have a car. He was just standing around while black. And he got arrested for that, charged with loitering. One of these crimes that you can, anybody can be arrested for, for loitering. You won't be arrested for loitering, but if you're poor, black, and disheveled, you will be arrested for loitering. And even poor, white, and disheveled, you'll be arrested for loitering. In fact, this disheveled uh, history professor crossing the street here in Atlanta was arrested uh, b because he was uh, disheveled, as so many academics are. Uh, need, to, need to dress up a little bit more. Uh, but um, uh, at any rate, he'd been there for 13 months. He had never seen a lawyer in 13 months. He had never seen a judge. And when Atiyah went to the clerk's office and said, what's this man doing in jail, and why hadn't he had a hearing or anything? He said, oh, the charges were dropped four months ago. 
Nobody had bothered. These are the throwaway people of our society. Nobody even bothered uh, to call the jail uh, and tell them uh, what had happened. Well, there's a whole lot more I can say about counsel, but I don't have time. But I want to say one thing. This was a case just decided last month, Hort, uh, Holsey versus Warden, decided by the 11th Circuit. Holsey's lead lawyer drank a quart of vodka every night during the trial while also preparing to be sued criminally and to be prosecuted and disbarred for stealing client funds. He admitted after the trial that he probably, uh, during the time he was supposed to be preparing, he shouldn't have been allowed to represent anybody due to his condition and his impending indictment and his alcohol problem. Uh, judge Ronnie Joe Lane, a judge from down in South Georgia in Seminole County, heard the case, and after he heard the case, he said um, that no one can seriously believe that this man had the constitutional guarantee of effective assistance of counsel. Well, that was reversed by the Georgia Supreme Court, and it just was upheld by the United States Court of Appeals. This is not 1940. This is last month that the, Supreme, that the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals here in Atlanta is saying you can put somebody to death even though their lawyer was drinking a quart of vodka a night and preparing for his indictment uh, for stealing funds. What can be done about it? Because uh, we don't want to talk about all these problems and not talk about what can be done. Uh, what do you do when the three branches of government are all in blatant violation of the Constitution? The legislature won't fund it. As Robert Kennedy said, the poor person accused of a crime has no lobby. And indigent defense, not only in Georgia, but throughout the country, is dramatically underfunded. And the courts won't enforce it, and the executive branch won't. Um, lawyers, as I said earlier, have a special duty. Uh, because we're the trustees of this system. The, the, the justice system is not just a get-rich-quick scheme for lawyers. It is that. And many lawyers get very, very rich by rearranging the assets of the upper 1% or whatever it is that they do. But that's not the goal of the legal profession. It's supposed to be a service profession. It's supposed to serve people, resolve disputes in a reasonable, efficient, and cost-effective manner. Of course, we're way far away from that. Uh, but lawyers have to look after uh, the right to counsel because nobody else is going to do it. Uh, and, and it can't be like the Georgia Bar, which is interested in avoiding any conflicts with the legislature and making sure lawyers make as much money as possible. Uh, lawyers uh, have to be involved. This has to be the most important thing we do. Chief Justice Roberts said, the way to stop discrimination so I don't think he meant this, but this is what he said. The way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. He needs to worry less about university admissions and more about the criminal justice system. He needs to take that message to every prosecutor, every justice of the peace, every police officer, every jailer in this country. And he needs to tell them, stop stopping and frisking people on the basis of race. Stop charging and plea bargaining on the basis of race. Stop striking jurors on the basis of race. In fact, if we're going to end discrimination in the selection of juries, which is the only chance people of color have because there's so few people in the profession to be judges or prosecutors or, or lawyers, then we have to eliminate the peremptory strike. That's what Thurgood Marshall said when Batson was decided. It's interesting, Thurgood Marshall is the only person on the Supreme Court actually been in the pit, actually represented people. And when the Supreme Court decided Batson, they said, it's not going to work, I'll tell you, it's not going to work. And when they decided Strickland versus Washington about the right to counsel, Thurgood Marshall wrote the only dissent, he said, it's not going to work. All kinds of ineptitude are going to get by under this, and boy, has he ever been right about that. But of course, um, one reason Batson came out was because so much criticism had been given of Swain. And these issues have to be raised over and over until they can no longer be ignored. We know what to do about counsel. It's not rocket science. There have to be independent public defender offices run by people who know what they're doing. I got a notice the other day from Montana saying that they're hiring a new public defender for the state of Montana and they're looking all over the entire United States of America to find the best person they can. Houston did the same thing just recently, found some federal defender in New York and brought them to run the public defender office in Houston. Here in Georgia, the governor just announces that some politician uh, is going to be the head of the public defender system. Um, indigent defense is not one scintilla of a consideration. Uh, 
Uh, and so we have to have people who are professionals and who have experiences uh, and, and so forth. Uh, we have to have adequately funded public defender offices, and one of your jobs, no matter what kind of law you practice, is to educate your legislators about the importance of funding for indigent defense. Because everybody says it's just giving money to criminals. And it's so easy to demagogue on this issue, and goodness gracious, we've seen it all over the place. But we have to be responsible. When Gideon was before the Supreme Court, Florida was trying to get the other states to come in on its side and say there's no right to counsel. And Walter Mondale, the Attorney General of Minnesota, and McCormick, the Attorney General uh, of Massachusetts, put together 23 states that came in on Gideon's side and said there is a right to counsel. If we're going to have a, a, a criminal system with integrity, then people have to be represented. That would never happen today. It's an acceptable practice today for prosecutors to try to keep people accused of crimes from being adequately represented. There has to be training because we have to do something uh, so that lawyers don't send clients letters asking the client to tell the lawyer why they need a preliminary hearing. And without going into all the rest, the answer is you. The answer is you in terms of what's going to happen. Uh, sometimes when you see that everybody has failed, you just have to look around and say, well, we've just got to do it ourselves. And those of you who want to become public defenders and take on this system, and I think the only way we're going to make it anywhere is building from the bottom up, trying to overcome a culture that goes back centuries. And it's by people going and doing, as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, uh, wearing their hearts out in pursuit of the unattainable. It's a tremendous challenge because the caseloads are so heavy, the resources are so minimal. There are no expert witnesses uh, for most public defenders. Uh, offices have gone years without using uh, public, uh, without using expert witnesses. Absolutely essential. A state calls three, four, five expert witnesses. Nothing. Um, but I, I, I liken the work that I have done to sort of the Underground Railroad and say I can't solve the whole problem, but we can get one person across at a time. For one person, you can make the right to counsel. You can make Gideon versus Wainwright a reality. You can give that person the time and attention, the counseling, the comfort, the support that everybody ought to have who's accused of a crime. Um, it's a huge undertaking. Uh, and it's the continuation of a struggle that's gone on for a long time, and it certainly looks like a losing battle. And it may always be a losing battle, but it's a battle that can never be abandoned. And it's something that's much bigger than any one of us, and each of you and all of us have the ability to help one person at a time. Dr. King used to say, we stand on the shoulders of others so that someday people could stand on our shoulders. There's a new book out called Devil in the Grove, which I recommend too. I'm recommending a lot of books today, but this is a great one by Gilbert King about Thurgood Marshall, about this African-American lawyer in the time of segregation going down to Lake County, Florida and representing people in criminal cases. And read Thurgood Marshall's biography about how when he was not long out of law school, he gets on a train and goes from Baltimore to Oklahoma City, and then takes the bus to Hugo, Oklahoma, and defends a man in a death penalty case, a black man in a death penalty case, where all the black people have to sit in the balcony. And the only two African Americans on the floor of Thurgood Marshall and his client, who was innocent, and therefore was sentenced to life imprisonment. And finally, Stand on the shoulders of, of two lawyers from Chattanooga, Noah Pardon and Stiles Hutchins. At the turn of the century, after the Civil War, these were two African Americans who amazingly, somehow, had a thriving law practice in Chattanooga, Tennessee, right north of us. And there was a man tried, uh, Ed Johnson, who was accused of rape of a white woman. Uh, it was pretty clear that he was not guilty of the crime. Uh, he was convicted and sentenced to death, and his lawyers suggested that he should not appeal, which is hard to imagine given the sentence that he had. One day, Ed Johnson's father goes to the law firm of Stiles Hutchins and Noah Pardon, and he sees Noah Pardon, and he asks him if they will take the case. And um, Pardon realizes what this is all about, and he goes to his partner and he says, are we going to take the case? And Stiles Hutchins says, much has been given to us by God and by man, and now much is expected. They took the case. Noah Pardon took a train to Washington 
He argued before the first Justice Harlan and got a stay of execution. That night, their client was lynched. Uh, he was taken to the bridge, if you've been to Chattanooga, and hung off the bridge and shot repeatedly. The thing that I always think about with that case is that when Noah Pardon and Stiles Hutchins were making that decision, do we take this case? I mean, after this happened, the minister preached a sermon against the death, uh, against lynching, his house burned down. Pardon and Stiles' law office was trashed repeatedly, their homes. But then just a short time after this happened, after the lynching, they left Chattanooga and never came back again. And so you have to know that when they were thinking about, do we take this on, they knew that nothing would ever be the same again in their law practice, in their community, and who they were, and how they made a living. And yet Stiles Hutchins says, much has been given, and we're going to take this case. I say, you cannot repeat that saying often enough during your career at the bar. They were asked to do the impossible. And in asking you to take this on, I am asking you perhaps to do the impossible. But as James Baldwin said in The Fire Next Time, I know that I am asking the impossible, but in our time, as in every time, the impossible is the least that we can demand. And one is, after all, emboldened by the spectacle of human history and in general, the, America, the African experience in America, for it testifies to nothing less than the perpetual achievement of the impossible. Thank you.